learn, effective teaching and learning, Professor Aki Odebubi, the Director, Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, Professor Ayatollah Arebu. Our most distinguished facilitators, Professor Olufemi Bamiro, former Vice Chancellor of the University of Baden, the Pioneer Director, Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, our most revered, Professor Adedoyi Shoyibo, and our guest facilitator, Mr. Ukono, distinguished colleagues, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen. I did not realize when I was being given this assignment that I would be in the midst of my orgas and I have prepared certain things that whilst sharing ahead of this um, presentation with Professor Shoibo, I said, I feel incompetent to be making reference to history when indeed history is here. <laughs>
to become the program for entrepreneurship and innovation. And by 2007, the Center of Entrepreneurship Innovation was born. I would the stages that I have highlighted briefly. The initiator, the founding um, chairperson or chairman of that subcommittee is no other than Professor Adeto Ishoiko that is here today. Then he built it up along with he invited virtually every one of us. And there was a time that he identified a gap and he thought the best person to fill that gap was Professor Olufemi Bamiru. Based on his own connection and experience at the Lagos Business School. And of course, as soon as he came on board, we knew the difference. Because Lagos people, business environment and even the way and manner they do things at the Lagos Business School just transformed our operation. Indeed, at that time, he was not the Vice Chancellor, but he was the Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration for the University of Bible. And that made us to make that necessary leap that has brought the um, sense to what it is today. And by 2007, when the, it was before Senate to uh, transform the program to um, the center, he was there on the seat as the chair of Senate, as the vice chancellor of the University of Paris. So again, history is here with us. And so, the UI vision and mission. The vision of the university, does anybody even know? Do we know? Are we conversant? Can we recite it? Anyway, you can. Okay. Can somebody really recite it for us then? You can, you, 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 can, you can look at it on the board. Can somebody recite it for us? To be a world-class institution for academic excellence geared towards meeting societal needs as the mission. And then the mission to expand the frontiers of knowledge through provision of excellent conditions for learning and research. And to produce graduates who are worthy in character and found sound judgment and to contribute to the transformation of society through creativity and innovation. And the last one, to serve as a dynamic custodian of society's salutary, society's salutary values and those sustain its integrity. Thank you very much. I'm glad that I asked somebody to, to read it. The vision of the University of Ibadan is to be a world class for academic excellence geared towards meeting societal needs. It's a simple vision, but it encompasses so much. Societal needs. Please, if we know nothing else, about the University of Ibadan. We must learn this and we must let it resonate in our spirit. We are set up for meeting societal needs. And among the mission which has been read out, you can see bullet three is to contribute to the transformation of society through creativity and innovation. And the UI anthem, which again we have sang this morning, line five of it says, 
that our nation, our nation, here we are in UI, in Nibadon, in one corner of UI, and we are hoping that our nation may with pride help to build the world. It means that here in this little cubicle that we are in, called the University of Ibadan, we desire to have not just an impact on Nigeria, not just an impact on Ibadan, not just an impact on Oyo State, but the vision is that our impact would go beyond this immediate environment into a global dimension. And so, the vision of the CEI dovetails directly into the vision of the University of Chicago. It's not far-fetched, it is linked and it is derived from the mission and the mandate of this university where we work. And it is to be a leader. And I make bold that word, the leader, in positively transforming society through entrepreneurship and innovation. It's just in another way, repeating what the University of Ghana stands for or claims to stand for. And in its mission, it is to unlock the entrepreneurial spirit or ideas in students and staff. And importantly also, we are not limited to just the students and staff, but we are responsible to the immediate business community around us. And we are to do this through training and other interventions and to develop sustainable enterprises. Really, the mission of the CEI includes developing enterprises and finally have partnerships with the private sector with policy makers, NGOs, and poverty alleviation, and all stakeholders in building a vibrant economy and a vibrant society that is enriched. Again, the motto of the CEI further elaborates or further um, stresses the need to transform Nigeria. Transforming Nigeria. So how has the CEI or the University of Ibadan translated this vision? So we have sat down or a group of people, the pioneers and everybody, all stakeholders together, sat together and crafted this vision. What they thought that the direction should be that we are going. And in transforming that um, vision, again, it is derived from the mandate of our university. Again, our university is not in isolation in this beat to transform society. Essentially, what are universities mandated to do? Why are universities created? Why if, why could we not have a polytechnic? Why not just a secondary school? What are universities and what do they stand for? And the meaning and um, purpose of universities, according to um, a foundation vice chancellor of one of the universities abroad. He said that university means 
a wish for less misery amongst the poor, less ignorance in schools, less bigotry in the temple, less suffering in the hospital, less fraud in business, less folly in politics. As you can see, it just means that universities essentially are that entity that is supposed to bring light to the world where there's darkness. Because it pervades all aspects of human endeavor, all aspects of human life. We've talked about hospital, we've talked about less fraud in business, talked about politics with less folly. Look at how our politics has become a playground where folly is the order of the day and it's a display of who can whatever. <laughs> a wish for less misery among the poor. So today, and this was in the 18th century, today are the universities fulfilling that role? What are universities expected to do? And in this, I will just highlight the different narratives, the different areas of the reach of universities. Universities first should be for learning and personal development. Secondly, universities should be a source of professional identification. You come in there, you are developed in a particular profession and along the um, strife of life, you continue in that profession and build the profession. And um, another is that universities should be a research engine for society. So, building new knowledge and using that knowledge to service society. It's also for business and industry and then for community engagement. Continuing in that um, role of universities, it's supposed to be repository and generator of knowledge, um, facilitator of viable employment, and universities were built to offer rational and timely criticism. Rational and timely criticism to governments. And then to present a large influence and be a body in civil society and the state and creating a cohesive and tolerant community where we have built students that are worthy, first in character and then in learning. You expect that society there will be a better place. So talking about timely criticisms, which is one of the expectations of universities to society. Are we in the position as an academic community to influence government? What does it take to be able to deliver on that mandate? First, it is required of that academic community to be credible. It is only in being credible that the society or government can trust whatever is coming from the academic community. And the image of the academic community in recent times has not been that credible. 
a lot of things, but the most recent of which is the um, video that has been going, audio that has been going viral about the university professor, change of maths, and so on and so forth. And there's so many others. What does Nollywood think about universities? When they sum up the image of the universities is about handouts, professors, and students, courses, and so on and so forth. So really, how do we change that image such that the universities will be in a position to be able to offer timely criticisms that will make an impact? That's just by the way. That's not entrepreneurship. Next. <laughs> And so, what is entrepreneurship? Our translation of entrepreneurship. One definition is that it is the act of creating business or businesses while building and scaling it to generate a profit. Do we agree on that definition? Although, I quickly go on to the next one, which I have made bolder which resonates with the vision of our university. And that definition is about modern entrepreneurship definition, if it may interest you to know. Goes beyond just building business for profit. It is talking about building the world. Entrepreneurship is about building the mind, making the mind so big that the youth or the aspiring business person does not see a barrier that that person believes and is able to think big enough to be able to make an impact on the world rather than just a small business and a little business enterprise, which the first definition is talking about. So in our own discharge of our responsibility towards our students, be they undergraduates, postgraduate, staff, and SMEs as we are, Intended to. Are we able to build or break down barriers in the minds of people for them to be able to think entrepreneurial? Okay, so what's the role of universities in delivering developing entrepreneurship? Universities as innovation drivers, and this is global picture. In the US, universities are linked, have a long tradition of close ties and collaboration between companies, between companies and universities. And each one of those companies is looking to affiliating with first-rate universities. Another experience or desire is that there would be a situation where there is constant transfer of technology from the universities to industry. And lastly, technology-intensive companies, companies on their own, would seek to locate their operations near the best universities. So you see that there's a cut between universities and industry, where each one sees mutual benefits from linking with one another. And 
Look at the top 15 most innovative nations of the world. South Korea, Sweden, Singapore, Germany, Switzerland, Japan, Finland, Denmark, France, Israel, USA, Austria. Here, we do not even see any African nation. But according to this index, the concentration of researchers in Israel is very high. It is second only well, no, Denmark is second only to Israel. Israel is unique in the sense that a long time ago they have recognized this connection between density of researchers and development of the nation. And the presence of research universities is now widely viewed as a necessary condition to bring about economic development. I need to repeat that. That is, any nation now that thinks it wants to develop, the way to go is to begin to develop on its universities, particularly research intensive universities. The state of Maryland, as an example, is an example of a university-driven economic development. It invests up to 90% of its economic development budget in to its universities. If the budget for economic development this year is about 100 million, I, of course, certainly is more than that, it will give 90% of that to universities because it knows that in investing in universities, that's where uh, the secret of its growth is. And as a result, Maryland receives more research dollars per capita than any other state. It has a variety of different institutions, that's why you have the NIH and so on and so forth. And the impact of a single research university on a region, a university on a region, and an example is the MIT. In 2004 alone, MIT recorded 1.3 patents, registered 1.3 patient, patents, launched 20 startup companies, that is, started 20 companies, a university, spent $1.2 billion, not Naira, on sponsored research. And data from 1994, MIT graduates had founded over 4,000 companies, employing 1.1 million people. And here we are talking about unemployment and how many universities do we have in Nigeria? And generating 232 billion in sales worldwide. One university, MIT. MIT is flanked by other great research universities, including Harvard, Tufts, the University of Massachusetts, Boston University, and others. And since the early 1970s, spin-offs from these institutions have created a thriving pharmaceutical industry where nothing existed before. I will go well, speedily to the example of Israel. And this is a quote. As an Israeli and an entrepreneur and the general manager of Microsoft Ventures, Ventures Accelerated Program, that's in Israel. I am constantly asked to explain the secret behind the massive success of Israeli startups. Um, how did Israel become a home? You cannot read this, so I'll just highlight it. Um, in one year, 
Israeli startups would generate up to about 15 billion in sales. That is, the Israel has mastered the art of starting businesses and then selling them. So in one year, they can sell up to about 15 billion dollars of um, business startups. Then, how do they develop? They have transformed challenges into assets. They, the land is arid, so they excel in a Greek technology. There are no resources, so they develop alternative to fuel. Israel is surrounded by enemies, so its military, its technology, so its military technology is superb, and mandatory military service to everyone. It's a training that takes them through how many things? It's a training that takes them through some kind of um, a system where you become disciplined. One of the greatest challenges of this nation is in discipline. And there's diversity, it's a tiny company. Again, Israel realizes that its entire population is 6 million people. And so, they, their market is so limited that they have made the world its own market. If we cannot get enough people to buy on our own soil, our market will become the entire world. And it's easy to start a company in Israel. Israel spends about 4.4% of its GDP on research, strong sense of solidarity, and the courage to try and fail. That's the strength of Israel. So with this realization, what has Nigeria's national awareness and its policy direction been? In 2006, remember UI started in 2002. In two, for another four years before federal government directed that all Nigerian university undergraduates be required to offer a compulsory course in entrepreneurship, which took effect from 2007 to 2008. The course would open them to other viable employment opportunities and it was said that we will not stop at giving our youth quality education. Very well said. And so, all this was taken from the website of Covenant University. Why did I choose Covenant University? Because I have met them at different fora, and these are the things that they claim. They say that um, Covenant University, their students start business early. Uh, the university pioneered the study of entrepreneurship in the country and has produced over 10,000 graduates, some of whom are doing well in their own businesses. This is the Covenant University, their Center for Entrepreneurship Development Studies, and they claim again that this is the most premier, oops, premier entrepreneurial center in the country and pushing the limits of innovation in order to develop world-class products and solutions. Truly, we are supposed to be the leader. They are claiming leadership and um, premier. And so, I take us back to our historical perspective. See how long ago we have been next. But how did UI translate, and how is UI translating the directive? We all know, because we are all part of this program, that rather than train hands like other institutions do, where they have skills, 
laboratory, you high has chosen, based on everything that we have said so far, that is the training of the mind rather than the hands. Because the person that will affect the world, a person that has a mind big enough to conquer the world would not be limited in his mind. And you are determined to focus on innovation because it is innovation that will drive that change that we're looking at. Again, UI has determined to strengthen and to drive intellectual property rights and its because we're looking at patents and tangible outputs from our research. And we have avoided establishing workshops. The types where you have tailoring workshop, shoemaking workshop, hairdressing workshop. You do not really, with um, a score of 280, 300 and guinea as jam, you don't need that. You will be, some of you can bear me with this. Some of the businesses that have emanated, few though they are, from here, if we had been restricted to workshops, hairdressing workshop or whatever, they would not have come about because we would never have thought that far. We are encouraging that our students will think and make a change. And so, we want to encourage and set up incubators, either real or virtual. Real in the sense that if you have an animal farm, do you want to have it next to a restaurant? So sometimes you cannot put everything in one space as an incubator, okay? Establish and strengthen linkages and profitable networks, especially with the private sector. And encourage and nurture an ecosystem of entrepreneurs. And finally, we must ensure that we facilitate access to finance. So, currently, what do we major on? And we realize that we are teaching university ETR 301, GES 301, MSCN, and so on and so forth. We are also training. We are training, we have a sustainable enterprise training. We have been involved in the gel, growing enterprise leaders. Um, we also were involved in the wind, but there are, well, I shouldn't say countless, but there are several other programs ongoing. We must ensure that not only do we lead the way, we also are part of what is going on. And our partnerships, Madam Director Ma, I may not be able to get, you remember I asked them to come and pick up um, one of the brochures. This is what I found, but I'm sure there are lots more than this. So, going back to the topic or the title of the presentation, what is the vision of the university? What is the purpose for which we are set up? Are we, in assessing ourselves, are we fit for the purpose? Or are we tending in the direction of fitness for the purpose of our existence? Again, permit me to go and share the example of the Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. This university was set up strictly for the purpose of developing the, the, the Negev region of Israel. I repeat that again. The purpose of which the university was set up was the fact that that Negev region needed to be developed. And they did not think of building estates, housing estates. 
They did not think of building an airport. They did not think of building those other things. They thought if we must develop plant a university. And that's telling us something. So our vision reassessed. Let us assess ourselves as a center. In the clarity of purpose, I think we are together and we do really have a clear idea of what our purpose is. So I will score off high on that. And we are the leader. And we must never be railroaded into these skills acquisition, skills acquisition. Yes, people would certainly need skills along the path of entrepreneurship. They can get skills anywhere, or they can hire skilled labor. As an entrepreneur, we do not trivialize entrepreneurship to skills acquisition. So we are still the leader in maintaining that stance. Available resources, in terms of manpower, we are gathered here, the highest of manpower that is available on the surface of Nigerian soil, or even the world, we are gathered here. And so, also on the aspect of manpower, we are high. On research capa capacity, we also will raise ourselves as passing for we are modules for several reasons, funding being one of them. Funding is average, and this is largely from donor funding. Our colleagues are attracting uh, research grants, and so there's some funding. Orientation of our researchers. What is our orientation? Our orientation is opposite to the purpose, I must say. What do I mean by that? If our purpose is to develop society and our output is not developing society, then it's opposite to purpose. And I think it is largely rooted in our reward system. Because if you major in going out to society and community, how are you ranked on the on, on, on the um, promotion guideline. It does not favor you. So, perhaps we would need to look at that because it is contrary to the purpose for which we were set up. And government support is inadequate. Linkages network with the private sector is extremely weak. The rationale and timely criticism is also weak. As a matter of fact, universities do not have a voice. They do not have a voice. Because I said, credibility is important in being able to raise your voice. So, what we do need is some reorientation in the area of, quickly share this, Nikola Tesla, an inventor in so many years ago. Highlights invented something. I'm just looking at profiles from the internet. Steve Jobs, he said, I want to put a thing in the universe. Thinking beyond the microscopic view and going to the universe. Innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. And design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. Mark Zuckerberg, who is currently in the eye of the storm. <laughs> and he thinks by giving people the power to share, we are making the world thinking globally, not limited in their thoughts. And we may say these are foreigners. Cyprian Emeka Uzo, the Nigerian with, a, with more than 160 patents, 
in the world. Nigeria is a genius of computing. He's the inventor of the year 2006. He has 126 patents in the United States and more than 160 worldwide patents. A lady, professor of chemistry, um, Nigerian professor Sadiq, has five patents, over 160 scientific publications, 350 invited lectures, invited lecture, impact on society. Impact on society. Patents, patents. And this was an advert on the internet. Need to purchase patents? Do you want to purchase patents? There was really an assembly on the 11th to the 15th of April in Geneva where researchers, inventors from 40 countries would meet together and their inventions would be examined for the purpose of purchasing. Next. I do not have time to show this, but it's a video trending on social media about recognition of people's contribution to development of society through their innovations and their research. We are the CEI, are the transformation that you are, and indeed, Nigeria needs. We will be able to rise to the occasion in the delivery and communicating this information to our students and trainers. Thank you. So we have 10 minutes to ask questions and I just want to advise that you make it as uh, straightforward as possible. Even if we have comments, it should be as straightforward as you can. Can we have comments and questions? Uh, good morning, everybody. Let me appreciate uh, my professor, um, whenever I sit to her. I always you know, thank her for having her in our university. I am always impressed when people talk about how do we change this nation to what we want it to be. And uh, she has done that again this morning in terms of entrepreneurship development. But there is a question that, I, that always comes to mind. When we are talking about developing our nation, the big question is, we are at the enabling environment. And she has said it again this morning on how countries that have developed try to support, give all the necessary assistance to the or people that are in need of it in terms of funding research. President, I'm talking to you, there are so many things that we lack in our environment here. Imagine a student of chemistry who will be looking for sodium or even the sea water to work. I want to make a genius out of that individual. You and I know that many of our students are when they go abroad, where the environment is more enabling, they become genius automatically. The question is, where do we go from here? How can we make our government more responsible to the issue of ensuring that the environment is more enabling? Yes, if the government is failing, what can we also do in terms of looking inward? to create this you know, enabling environment. I know C9 is doing that, but how much support are we getting to get to where we're supposed to get to? Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the wonderful presentation. My name is Amanda Rude. Um, I'll have some um, little visibility about uh, the URSF. And um, we've seen some inventions and all that. My concern is how come we are finding it difficult to translate this resource of researchers into viable uh, corporate organizations and like successful startups. 
I really want to know what the vision should be towards um, achieving such. So, okay, we'll see the example of the MIT like you gave us, which is similar to what we are trying to do with this plan with the resin. But I see that um, there's a lack of synergy or cutting along, so to say, within the CI or um, the general um, how do I do it? entrepreneurship culture. It, it's not seeping down to the individual departments. You are talking about physics, chemistry, technology, um, agriculture, and what I Thank you. I just want to talk about the support system. Uh, beautiful lecture I gave by Kim. I hope you have eyes. Thank you. Uh, so what I'm talking about support, I, I know the university that uh, maybe gives the autonomy of the uh, ownership of the uh, university is not actually addressed. And when we talk about financing and support in that direction, I noticed that uh, maybe, I don't know whether that is possible, that most of the idea, instead of going to infrastructure building is maybe they can come more into uh, support for developing entrepreneurship activities, minds, so that we can avoid that. Uh, Paul Bright rightly said that if, if, the, if the student in chemistry had never even found the use of it, it's under pressure to find materials to work with. So how do we expect that such a person will become a genius when the enabling environment is not created? I just want to find out, is there a way that we can find more support in terms of uh, access to the enabling environment and materials to work with? Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to join my voice with others to thank uh, um, Professor Kef for the lecture. Um, I'd like to make a comment on some of the things that we do at times in the University of Ibadan, which I don't think is really uh, helpful to us because of our way of looking at some of these things. And one of it was mentioned in the lecture, the fact that we don't want workshops. We don't want to have a hairdressing uh, workshop or uh, carpentry workshop and all that. And yet we know that some of these things are useful and helpful to people who want to really key into entrepreneurship. The only thing I think we should do is not to do it the regular way, to also introduce innovation into it. And at times we lose something, we lose out in some of these areas because of these are Permit me if I'm using the wrong language or I'm being hard on the university. Our cocky uh, stance, we don't belong to that level. We are much higher than that. You know, we've lost out on a number of things. So I think we shouldn't lose out any longer. But we begin to also see it as part of the vision, you know, as part of what we want to introduce innovation into and make them better and then use them as even. Uh, make them even as startups because the new ways will do them and the new and intro, I mean the new things will introduce into them and bring people on board to come and learn in this new way. That would just be a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am just enthused by what I've had. Um, I'm particularly happy that uh, we have one that one step forward than the kind of thing that during my time we did. Uh, I'm very happy that I paid for him that he's more successful than he was. And he certainly has shown, from my point of view, that he was extremely more successful than he was. Reason, you can see the frontier of entrepreneurship beyond what happened during my time as director. One particular area is the territory, if I may use that word, that entrepreneurship education, enterprise and entrepreneurship education has, uh, has expanded to the U.S. If you look at the trainings, if I can use that, 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 that word advisedly, of the kind of qualifications that entrepreneurship has 
uh, has uh, expanded into the UI. You, you have it not just as courses, you have it as, as two types of master's program, MSc and MED Entrepreneurship Education, something like that. And that is extending the frontier further into other areas that it would not have been. That, in my view, is a lot of achievement. We can have a lot more impact on more people and more population as we use it in statistics and economics so that the overall impact will be much broader. That is what I've seen that the UI Entrepreneurship Education and Enterprise Education Program has expanded into. While we may think that uh, we were too high class in not going into um, workshops like carpentry and so on and so forth, but we define your vision. You can decide to be totally different, affect people in a different class. And that class, by the 8020 rule, 20% will have 80% impact. We don't want to be in the reality of 80% that will have 20% impact. I think that is the vision of UI. Be the one that will be among the top 20% that will have 80% impact which would be much more than if you are in what we jokingly say in Yoruba, a majority. <laughs> you know, the majority of them have unlimited impact. It looks nice, but if you define a vision for yourself to have greater impact, belong to the Harvard and the MITs of this world, and show that impact. Certainly, MIT is done in the past of those who are training tailors or training um, food sellers, and so on and so forth. I want us to look it at that view, and that where we have that impact, let us make extremely great impact. Thank you. Well, I will say I have the opportunity when I give the, my own lecture, to say, but I just feel that one can quickly, quickly comment, you know, on some of the points uh, that have been raised from the floor. Uh, well, somebody talking about the environment, I am going to take the North Environment from point of view of funding. Because all these things we are talking about, research, innovation. The question is how much research are we doing in the Nigerian university system? Not much. I mean, when I was last year, said, most of the research grants were coming from outside. The WHO and all these things, but one thing about research grants coming from outside is that they come in areas of interest to those who are funding here. It's not free lunch. Well, I must say that in 2009, when government decided that, well, they must want research, they allocated 3 billion for research in the Nigerian University system. And some of us were called upon to help. They thought that what we, some people said, oh, let us call for research proposals. I said, no, what is 3 billion? I mean, at that time, I think there were close to 100 universities. Now, what is the billion for research in one already university? I mean, it's nothing. What you have to do is, is there, does the nation have a research agenda? You must have national research agenda. What are the areas you are challenging, you know, your research community to provide solutions? I mean, Professor Kerr has mentioned Israel and so on. Go and look at their research paper. No, there's connection to solving Problem. Identify problems. It's not just research for research sake. And those who are funding research, they are not funding for funding sake. No. They put money there to get solution. And when the solution, I mean, because there's connection with both the private sector and the university, it's not the type of research that we sit in, uh, research, I mean, sitting in the shelf or the research that we do that you just want to publish and then get your promotion. It goes beyond that. So we came up with this as agenda, science, technology, innovation, in three thematic areas. We now call for proposals in those three areas, identifying areas of interest based on the challenges that we have identified. And the first part of our proposal, we got only 100 proposals. And by the time we are reading through the proposals, we've only found 13. 
Now, we see somebody who wrote a research proposal, handwritten, not even typed. And she was asking for 20 million. Uh, that shows you the level there. But you cannot blame them. Because they are not being any proposal written. You know what I mean? They just didn't know. But by the time we did the second round, the number of research proposals went to 200. And we were able to recommend about that. Then when the minister made the statement that Nigerian research, I mean university people are not doing any research. We even gave them money, they are not even spending. The research committee responded with 876 research proposals. And by the time we went through those proposals, there are quite a number of them that were really, really excellent that should be funded. And we are only able to fund about 40 something. But by the time now, in 2016, we call for a proposal. We've got 1,876 proposals. In other words, the university committee gradually, they are responding. But the funding, that was where we now had to take, I mean, talk to government to talk the fund. If you look at this, it's like, well, fantastic. Fantastic. And people are ready. But, test funds is the one that has been the backup of funding. Because the country does not have national research fund. Which is a shame. South Africa has national research uh, uh, funding council with a lot of money put in there. In Nigeria, no. We are still pressing for that now. But the point one is making is, for as long as you have a governance, that the level of intellectual input to governance is nothing to write about. They will not recognize the impact of this has into either policy making or, you know, economic development. We are talking of Vision 2020. You want to be among the 20 developing. How is that going to happen? How is that going to happen? Without you involving the key area of research. So it means that those who are involved, when they are talking about it, they themselves do not appreciate the level I mean, the extent to which they must bring your university community in terms of research, training, and so on to be able to achieve it. It's still fundamental. If the truth must be told, what is the level of international governance? Let us look at it. What is the level? Is it in education? Is it in uh, what I mean, in uh, economy? Is there even an economic policy for this country? I mean, these are the fundamentals. Those countries you are talking about, they have been able to I mean, identify areas that they are moving, they are moving their nation, and they are able to see the research component, how they must evolve their university, how they must come. But like somebody said, from our own end, can we start looking for solutions? Now, I happen to be a member of the committee negotiating with us. And you know, it has been handy. The university system, nothing destroys the university system more than an unstable calendar. Yes. That is the greatest destroyer of your system. Because you say you want to be a global university. You want to be a global player. How can you be a global player when from one university to the other, you are operating different calendars? You are not matching with the world. So with this present negotiation, what we are trying to tell us is that look, enough is enough. We can no longer be talking of, you know, uh, that we want to be excited at the weapon. Can we come up with something sustainable? A sustainable system. Let's say of funding. And I must say that we still have a long way to go. For as long as you are saying that there is no way in the world where government can fund education completely. No. For as long as we are deceiving ourselves, saying that. Uh, Tuition fee, free. Where will the resources come from? I mean, when I was vice chancellor, I mean, in the system now, universities are not budgeting. That's one of the things we are telling ourselves in the negotiation. When somebody, I was VC and they called us to Abuja that uh, we are shouting the uh, universities that have been underfunded. They called us to Abuja, I was a VC. I was unfortunately sitting by the side of one of the funding agencies where they introduced me as the VC of University of Bagam. And the man said, oh, this is University of oh, great. That is the only thing that I'm going to do. It's one of the best in the world. 
He said, come on, let me ask you. How much do you need and how much are you giving? Uh, <laughs> I was scratching my head. <laughs> but is that question not fair? Yes, yeah. Jeffo. How much do you need to run in life? And how much are you giving? And how are you going to finance this show for? I could not answer. But why, why is it I couldn't answer? It's because from 2005 to the present, government has been giving us every load. No government has been asking us for any budget. The government is not asking you, how much do you need? It is how much I can give you. Take it or leave it. How is the nation going to move that way? And we, the university, we stop budgeting. Thank God that as soon as what is coming, we have said that first thing first, let everybody sit down. Come on with needs based budget. How much do you need for all these things we are talking about? Is it in SARS? Is it all? I mean, because the first casualty in a situation where you have serious short for is the quality of your program. Definitely. That's the first casualty. Yes, you will get salary, everything will be peaceful. You know you don't go outside because you have uh, money in your pocket. But are you doing what you should be doing as an agent of development? So these are the fundamental questions. So we are now part two. We have a lot to do. To be, if we are forcing government now to meet our needs, it is to be preferred than uh, some people are saying uh, we must do UNESCO 26%. What is 26% UNESCO? UNESCO never prescribed any percentage for anybody. It was just something coming from some side down and then people are not feeling with that. No. What is at issue is how much we need and how much are we being given. So this type of thing uh, is university that we have to, you know, have been really work on this. And there's no way. You talk of research, there may innovation and so on. I'll have the quality when I make my presentation. One of the case studies that we share with you, we illustrate that. How do you get research results to the market? Innovation. It is a different ball game. I can say straight away, what we are now telling them, we are now accepted. There is a difference between funding research and funding innovation. They are not the same. And I will use the UI example to illustrate that. And I'm hoping, and we, I think government and our fund is gradually agreeing that not only must we have national research fund, we must have national innovation fund to fund innovation. Maybe that will encourage some of the people who have like, research ideas or research results to now try to commercialize. For that the way that you can make it. But in terms of entrepreneurship, I still have something to say about that. That what do you really mean by entrepreneurship in relation to programs in the university? I like that because it's data, so I don't have to say that. You need to say that well, the game is, I mean, it's not in our court. For us to change government towards increasing the funding, you know, streams coming to university so that you can do. Or oh, I mean, all these things we are talking about. It's unfortunate. Somebody in chemistry, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, 15, 20 years ago, one of the, you will know chemistry students in the campus. They will have their white to barrels, I mean, green particles from morning till night and so on. But now, alternative to practical. In the university? In the university. You do alternative to practical. Then you are a teacher. You go to the secondary school, and what do you do? Theory of, uh, no, that's your time to practical. In the university, it's a theory of uh, practical. <laughs> How will the nation move forward? But these are challenges for all of us. <laughs> to me, it's not just with the government. On our own side, too, we have an important role to play, we have an important role to play, to change the whole dynamics, you know, the thing. Otherwise, we just continue, we'll be getting our salary, and uh, we think that everything is okay. No, it is not okay. The high level of unemployment in there, coming from the university, are we really producing employable graduates? These are some of the things I will discuss, you know, when I make my own presentation. Thank you. Most of the questions have been answered in a very elaborate way, so I want to thank you. Um, to reassure Professor Meke that um, we're not preaching total elimination of oceans. What we're looking at is integrated entrepreneurship 
training. Those workshops don't necessarily have to exist in our entrepreneurship center, but there should be a workshop for mechanical engineering in the faculty of technology. There should be uh, a food and um, agro development in agri extension. There is in human, there should be a standard one in human nutrition such that since our students spread across the entire university, wherever they are, they should have the adequate laboratory where they are. But that only of eyes and mind will be ours. And even if they need hairdressing exposure, we post them out, they'll get it there. So that we're not limiting them by informally making them to feel that these are the only available areas for participation. And as Professor Manro already elaborated, talking about how research never gets converted to um, to to commercialization. There is a, a, a process of technology transfer which includes the interplay and participation of industry as well as financiers in, in the form of angel funders, in the form of um, uh, different kinds of funding that play at that level. As a researcher, once you take your research to the point where there's that tangible output that can be patented, then someone else takes over. And but then that trust that I made mention of, that credibility, that whatever you claim that you have can actually work on the field is also very important. So thank you very much.